Good evening, everybody. We appreciate you joining us here in the beginning of 2021. Uh, who would have thought we'd ever got, we'd, we would have ever gotten to this point in 2021, but here we are, uh, 2020's behind us, thank goodness. And uh, we are super excited to get to start um, a whole new year. Uh, this is our first webinar for the year, which for us, this is always uh, uh, tends to be one that generates a lot of excitement and energy. Um, as we kick off New Year's, uh, we appreciate all of you registering and signing up for this tonight. Um, we've got people from all over Arizona. In fact, we were just reviewing over the last a few minutes ago. We've got Texas here with us tonight. Um, we've got California um, from, uh, from uh, over in California joining us. So um, anyway, and all over the state of Arizona. So thanks for being here. Um, hey, Julie, looks like you're uh, coming to us uh, here in Arizona as well. So, so anyway, we, we appreciate wherever you're coming from, know that we appreciate you guys being here this evening. Um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of things for you. We are monitoring the chat um, and the question and answer boxes. You're welcome to drop questions as we talk tonight um, into, uh, into either of those boxes. We'll be monitoring those. Um, I've got Tavia, our program assistant in the other room, social distancing from us this evening. Um, she'll be helping to monitor those as well and make sure that any resources that we, that we need to put up, we'll have those located in the chat for you tonight as well. We are gonna be recording tonight's session. Uh, these, uh, uh, the recording of this and uh, also all of the resources that we talk about, we will send links out to, the, to, to you uh, with all of those on Monday. So I'll be looking for that email uh, to come out with all that information. And then of course, once we're all completed, uh, my, my goal tonight is to get through all of your questions as best as we can uh, this evening. If there are any follow-up questions though that we need to get back to you on, we'll make sure that we reach back out to you and get that all taken care of. So my goal is to be in and out in about an hour. Um, if we get into question and answers and those just kind of continue to go, we will stay as long as we need to, to get through those. Um, again, you're welcome to, uh, to, 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 to log off at, uh, well, seven o'clock our time. Um, but uh, anyway, we do appreciate all of you being here this evening. For those who are uh, uh, new to SBDC or who have never really heard of SBDC before, um, we, are, we are not the SBA per se, but we are funded through a grant through the SBA and our host institution. So we're here with Eastern Arizona College. Uh, we do have, there are centers, SBDC centers across the entire uh, US. We'll pull a map up here in just a minute. But basically we provide no cost counseling to those that are already in business, those who are considering starting a business, those who aren't really sure where to start and what to go. Uh, we offer these, these webinars, seminars, classes, um, no cost, low cost, uh, to try and help get you as much information as possible uh, to help you start out. So, and really our mission, we really, we don't have checklists. We don't have, I'll, I'll give you some checklist information later to kind of help streamline some stuff. But really our mission is to help you. Um, help you realize that dream of, of business ownership. Um, we want to help existing businesses to, to really remain competitive in this crazy, crazy world, not even just global economy, but just try to help continue to be competitive and relevant uh, even, during a pan, even during a pandemic. So um, everything changes fast and furious around here. And so um, really we're here to assist and to help you with whatever your goals are, whatever the things are that you want to do for your business or whatever that business concept or idea might be. As I mentioned to you, we are located throughout the US. Um, again, Texas, California, I know that you have centers all over your states as well. Very, very strong networks in both Texas and California as well there. And as you can see throughout the entire nation, um, Hawaii, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Caribbean islands, um, all, of the US, uh, all, the, all of the US territories have SBDCs throughout all of them. Here in the state of Arizona, we're located basically with all of the community colleges throughout Arizona, all the way from Mojave Community College up in the northwest part of the state, down to here, down to Eastern Arizona College, Northland Pioneer College up in the northwest, or I'm sorry, up in the northeastern part of the state, and then of course Arizona Western um, and all points in between. We have a large number of satellite centers in a number of those communities as well uh, to help you uh, get to the closest resources available to you. Our center here, we cover uh, Graham, Greenlee, and Gila counties. So the Globe area, the Payson area, uh, we get to cover those areas. We love going over there and working with our small businesses in those areas and our community partners, as well as over in Greenlee County, Clifton, Marinci, and Duncan. So, um, but again, we do have those throughout the entire state. We do also have one of our key partners, the Arizona 
Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, or AZPTAC. Um, they're basically responsible for helping you to find contracting opportunities with the federal government and with state government. So they help take you, take you through all of those procurement processes, how to get into the SAMS process, how to get your DUNS numbers, how do you find those bidding opportunities to be able to get contracts with the federal government or the state government. That's a whole, that's a whole world in and of itself. And so we help to build the businesses, we help to grow the businesses and get them, get them so that they can then find those, those contracting opportunities. They are a sister organization. And just as the SBDC is, they, they do provide those, those services at no cost to you as the small business. Now, one of our other partners, <clears throat> which we've been with now for about a year, a little over a year, year and a half now, is the Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, they've been a great partner of ours for the last little while here in rural Arizona. Um, they are the economic development organization um, here in the Arizona, um, here in the Arizona, here in Arizona. Um, and really they have three, three main goals that they have, and that's to recruit out-of-state companies to expand those operations here, to work with existing companies here in Arizona to grow those businesses, and then to help create new jobs and businesses in some of those targeted industries. Um, some of the resources we're going to give to you this evening are going to come directly from the ACA, and we'll give you more website information to them a little bit later. Um, they've been a phenomenal partner of ours. They've done amazing things um, in, 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 in um, bringing our rural areas more to the statewide economic development focus that we have. Um, they've been, again, wonderful partners. We, we, we enjoy working with them. Um, and again, we're going to give you some more resources at the end, at the end of the night. Uh, that we hope will, will provide those of you who are in business with a lot more information on navigating the, the waters of small business and those who may be starting up will give you some of that information as well so all right so let's get into the topic of tonight we have a lot of information to cover um, so I'm, I'm assuming that most of you are here tonight because you want to start a business um, you have a concept that you're thinking about doing you have um, maybe an idea that you're kind of tossing around but you don't know really where to start uh, I know that we have a number of registrants, as I looked over the list, who are already in business, who are kind of thinking through, uh, did I do everything right? Did I handle things the right way? Um, we hear a lot from our small businesses. I wish I knew about you guys when I was starting my own business, because there are a lot of things that we can do to help you streamline that process. Uh, we go through this process on a daily and a weekly basis, or you might go through this once or twice in your life. And so whatever we can do to help streamline that down. But there are, some key, there are some key questions that I like to ask people who are considering a small business. There are some questions that I always like to ask before we start out. And number one is what's your experience or your education background? What are the things that you've, that you've done that prepares you to start this business? Do you have the physical, the mental, and the emotional abilities to be able to do that? If this is a, a production company, do you have the physical abilities of being able to do that? Do you have the mental capacity to really take care of all of the things that need to be done as a small business owner? And what about the emotional side of that? Um, being a small business owner myself previously, I will tell you that it is an emotional roller coaster. Um, there, are, there are great days and there are a lot of really bad days. And, and, and there are some days that can just be very emotionally draining for you. And so we want to always want to make sure that are we, do we have the capabilities? Do we have the capacities to be successful? as small business owners. Is there a niche market for your product or service? <clears throat> Meaning sometimes people have these really, really good ideas, but they are so niche. They are so, so small that the available market available to them may not be enough to be able to sustain that business. And so we always want to make sure, do we have a sustainable market uh, for that? Or are we, are, do we have such a small market that that we're just not gonna be able to be sustainable during that. How about financing? Um, I will tell you, it's just kind of a precursor to, uh, to later on um, when we talk about financing more in depth is that the days of 100% financing from banks are pretty much gone. Um, uh, there was a time in a, in, a, in a day when if you had a pulse um, uh, and, a, and, a, and a body temperature of 98.7, you could probably get fi funding. Um, those days are gone. Um, the pendulum has swung. It's definitely come back down. Financing is not quite so difficult to get. But do you have the ability to be able to get financing from whatever that lending institution might be? And we'll talk about those lending institutions a little bit later. But do you have the ability to be able to get that 
What about your family situation? Do you have a supportive family? Um, again, there's probably going to be a lot of times you're going to come home in the evenings um, after work. The family may have already eaten. Your, your meal may be in the microwave ready, ready to be warmed up. Um, are they okay if you miss a basketball game, um, a, a choir concert, uh, whatever those might be? There can be some long hours um, in re re regarding uh, as you're trying to be successful as a small business. And so we want to make sure that our family is supportive of us, um, that they, are, that they are, are willing to step up and to help do what they need to do in order for us to be successful uh, uh, in that business. And finally, when nobody else believes in your business, when nobody else thinks that you're going to be able to do this, are you going to be the leader? Can you be the champion? Can you be the cheerleader that's going to cheer on your business when it seems like nobody else uh, is going to be on board with you? Now, there are some times that we do need to walk away from businesses. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about exit strategies. But if you're not going to cheer for your business, if you're not going to talk up your business, if you're not going to promote your business, then who is? And so we have to prepare ourselves to really put ourselves out there many times and, and expose ourselves to our communities, uh, to potential customers in ways that we may not have ever done before. And so are, are we prepared to do that? to put ourselves out there and to really cheer and lead and champion our small businesses in order to make them successful. So those are some general questions that we like to ask. Um, the, the SBA um, has identified eight reasons why most small businesses fail in the first two years. And now you're probably thinking, wow, Kevin, you are the most upbeat, positive guy we've ever seen. You're giving us all the doom and gloom. Well, this is, this is my feeling about about um, kind of starting off with the things that we're starting off with. My feeling is this, if I have to cross a minefield, I don't know if you guys ever watched MASH when the little kid ran out in the middle of the minefield and, and, and BJ ran out to try and get him and they realized they had to find the map so that neither one of them stepped on the minefield. If I have to cross a minefield to, 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 to pick up a small child or, or even just to get from one side to the other, I wanna know where those mines are at so that I can navigate that field. Part of our job as, as, as small business development centers is to help identify where the mines are at and to, to work our way around those before we even open up our, our doors as small business. We can alleviate those issues. So we want to go, go through with these and then we're going to talk about how do we overcome these eight reasons so that you can be more successful in the opening of your business. So the first of these, which we've already talked about and really addressed a little bit here already, is the lack of experience. Do you have the experience that's needed in order to open up this business? I have a lot of people who come into my office and say, I'm going to open up a restaurant. And I'll ask the question, why do you want to open a restaurant? Well, I make really good lasagna. Now, you might laugh at that and think that's kind of silly, but that is a true story that, that, that happened here. And, and, and she, she was known for her lasagna and she felt like she could open a restaurant just because she made really good lasagna. Um, so, but she never really had restaurant experience. And so we had to have a lot of conversation about that, um, that she needed to gain that experience that she needed. We've talked about this and addressed this already, but having insufficient capital. We hear a lot about starting small businesses and opening them, bootstrapping them, being very, very lean when we first get open. And that's good, but we need to make sure that we have enough capital, not to make sure, uh, making sure we have enough inventory, but also making sure we have enough cash in the bank to carry ourselves for that first three months, six months, nine months, while we're developing the cash flow and trying to get clients coming in on a regular or customers coming in on a regular basis. <clears throat> Real estate agents will tell you location, location, location. This is absolutely true. Having a great business, but having it in the wrong location can be, can be devastating to a business. And I tell you that again, from personal experience, lots of research will go into, into those things, but there are some things that you just don't know. You might have a fantastic business, but if the businesses on both sides of you um, are, are the kind of business where you don't really want to associate with or that your customers want to associate with, that could be a, a, a driving factor in why people aren't coming into your business because they just don't feel comfortable of where we might be. Poor inventory management this is the fourth reason why most businesses fail. How many times have we gone to a small business and, and uh, we've gone in and said, hey, I, I, I understand that you sell shirts. I'd like to get this shirt. And they're like, great, uh, we, what size do you need? And I'd say, I need, I need a large. Oh, well, we, we, we have larges, but we don't have it in the color that you want. So I'm like, okay, no problem, I'll, I'll come back. 
And if I keep coming back and they continue to not have my size, my color, my style, my shape, how many times am I going to continue to go back to that business if they don't really have what I want or what I need? On the opposite side of that, as a small business, we can have every shape, size, color imaginable and not be able to, to sell that because we think we want to cover for everybody, but we have a large amount of inventory that's not coming off the shelves, which means we have cash sitting on the shelf that's not doing us any good. And when it comes time to pay the utilities, I will tell you now that you can't take a stack of shirts that you think are really cool and take them to the utility company and say, I've got a $573 bill. Here is $573 worth of shirts. They're not gonna, they're not gonna take that. So we have to be able to manage that inventory and, there's a, and it's a whole science to it. And in the beginning, we might have some extra inventory and there might be a lot of lessons to be learned there. And you'll learn more in time. Inventory, again, inventory management is going to become more fine tuned for you as you move along but we really want to do our research and find out what the market wants, find out what our customers really want before we open up those doors. Overinvestment in fixed assets is another big reason. How many people do you know that have tried to start up a new business and went out and bought the best and the finest and the newest of everything? Felt like they had to drive the 2021 Ford F2050, whatever, whatever size truck they have, four wheels and three engines and, and, and wrapped in, in, in all of the marketing materials that they have all of the business colors and they've spent thousands and thousands of dollars of that. And yet in the name of a business write-off purchased this, this massive truck and yet have a $1,200, $1,500, $2,000 a month payment on that truck when they're trying to just keep their doors open in the very beginning. I will tell you that many businesses can start by leasing equipment early on in the beginning, in, in the beginning finding used equipment that will help you be able to get in at a much lower price point so that we can keep those overhead expenses down as low as possible. And then we allow ourselves then to grow into, into more equipment, nicer equipment, um, whatever that the business, whatever might be needed by the business, we can grow into that into time. Um, so don't think that the big fancy truck with the big wrap around it is going to, is going to really drive your business because it's not. Um, a 1987 Chevy S10 pickup truck with a big ding, with a big ding right back behind the back door, uh, was a great truck with the landscaping company that we had in the, in the very beginnings of our of our, of, of our first business, um, and it and it got the job done, and we got a lot of work done, and that little truck just did it did its job. So again, really watch where we're spending our money in the beginnings of a of a business to ensure that we're not overspending in what we think we have to have as far as fixed assets goes. <clears throat> Poor credit arrangements. We always wanna figure out where are we getting our money from? Now, you all probably receive on a regular basis emails from companies saying, hey, we're gonna send you $20,000 today. But many times we, when we start to dig into the details of that, we find out that the interest rates or the terms, the amount of time you have to pay that loan off may not be really good or may not be in your best interest. 25% interest sounds like, oh my gosh, you've gotta be kidding me but we hear about those on a regular basis. That's 25% on an annualized basis that you're gonna pay back on, on the life of that loan. Um, now, I'm not saying that those, in, in, in certain opportunities, we may look at that and we, and we may take it, but we really wanna do our homework and identify where are we borrowing our money from and what makes the most sense for our small business so that we can give it time to breathe and time to grow um, and, and be able to make those payments early on so that we don't, not only have to close our doors as a small business, but we also don't hurt your credit as, a, as an individual as well. And we'll talk more about credit a little bit later. One of this, one of the, this is one of the, the great ones. And, and this and puts us probably higher on the list than where it really is. And that's using the business bank account for your personal fund, for your, for your own personal use. And that's going on saying, hey, mom wants some new shoes. I'm going to go use the business bank account. I'm going to go use the business credit card. And using that to, to, to buy dinner for your friends or to, or to do whatever you need to do or whatever you want to do, uh, putting that vacation on and, and, and in the name of a business expense, the personal use of business funds can, can drive a business out of business very, very quickly. We'll talk a little bit later about how we mitigate those and how we put some of the best practices, best practices that we can do to try and help. How do I, how do I gain access to the business funds, which are mine, but be able to use those in a, in a very appropriate and responsible way. 
And the last, uh, the last uh, reason why businesses fail may surprise you, and that is unexpected growth. Sometimes businesses grow too fast that they don't have enough cash to maintain the growth and they don't have the inventory needed or they could get the cash to get the inventory that they need or to be able to sustain employees. Um, um, we, 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 we have, uh, because we live in a mining community, we have a lot of businesses who will start to contract with, with, the, with um, Freeport McMoran, the copper mine here locally. And they have to have 60 to 90 days of capital to be able to carry themselves. They grow, but they don't have enough cash to sustain themselves during that period of time until the cash really starts to go, really starts to come back in. So we really wanna make sure that growth is not bad, but we need to manage that growth so that we can maintain it and, and grow it and, and control it to the point where we can grow into the point. It's easy to jump into the really quick things because we're thinking, oh my gosh, look at all the money that we're gonna make. But if we can't go into it and be able to sustain the growth there, again, it can either damage our reputation as a small business um, that we just don't meet our contracts or it could again, put us right out of business as part of that. Now, how do we overcome all of these? All right, there are three different ways we're gonna talk about tonight, gaining experience, um, uh, getting, a bit, getting your business education and doing your business plan. Um, the first of these, again, is we need to gain experience in these. Again, let's go back to my lady who, who made great lasagna, but and thought she wanted to go ahead and open up a restaurant, um, but she had no restaurant experience. My recommendation to there was, hey, why don't you go work in a restaurant for a little while? If you like to cook, go be a cook. Maybe you wanna go be a waitress. Maybe you wanna go just be a hostess go spend some time in the actual restaurant environment and see what that is like. Many of us think, oh yeah, that's, it's, it's simple. I'm gonna hire some employees. I'm gonna, I'm gonna order some food in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a lot of those kinds of things. But until we've actually had the experience in doing that, um, it's highly likely that you're going to fail in that small business because the learning curve costs money. And, and again, in the beginning of a small business, there may not be a lot of money and that you may not be able to sustain that, that learning curve. So we do two things to do. Number one, we've already talked about that. Go out and get the experience. If you want to open up a bar, go be a bartender. If you want to if you, go, go learn how to, how, to, how to make drinks, go learn how to manage your inventory, go learn how to, how to place orders, uh, go learn how to, how to hire employees and, and how to deal with tips, um, <clears throat> whatever, whatever those, uh, go learn how to, how to do your, all of your bookkeeping manage all of your finances during all of that. Go learn how to do all of that before you open your own bar. The second thing that you can do there is, again, money allowing this is to hire it in. Maybe you're not a good, or maybe you don't enjoy being uh, doing accounting. Um, find an accountant, find a bookkeeper who will take care of your books for you if you can afford that in the very beginning. Um, now I will tell you though, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, you need to understand your numbers um, you need, there are some things that you have to participate in as part of your business, and you can't just hire everything out because there are some very important things that you need to know as part of your business. So um, again, if you can afford it, hire out the, and, and bring the expertise into your business. But if not, then you need to go out and get that expertise and that knowledge yourself. Again, in the very beginning, you're going to have to be a jack of all trades. You may have to clean the toilets and take out the trash and, and, and do all the cleaning and do all of that after hours, whatever it might be. But again, if you can, um, later on, if there's an area that you're not very good at, then hire that out, either an outside professional or start to bring employees to start taking care of that for you. Now let's talk about the business education. We've talked about the experience side. Let's move on to the number two, which is your business education. Now this can be formal education. If you all want to register for business courses here at Eastern Arizona College, at Arizona State University, at, at, at your local community college, Mojave, Arizona Western, uh, Northland Pioneer College, um, wherever you might be from, by all means, we would love to have you take some business education. But I will tell you that most of my small business owners that I work with have never had a day worth of business education, but they have been doing and learning on the job over a number of years that they understand what they need to know in their area of small business. There's also, and, and we live in, a, in a, an amazing time for small businesses, is that there are online training resources available to you at your fingertips. YouTube <laughs> is one of the greatest training uh, websites in the entire world. I jokingly say this, but I learned how to tie shoes, learned how to tie my shoes watching YouTube about nine years ago. Now you're probably thinking, well, 
Kevin, you're not young. How did you tie your shoes before? Well, I used to tie them in the knot. I used to always kind of hang weird on my shoe. And I didn't realize I was tying my shoes the wrong way until I watched a gentleman on, on YouTube tie his shoes the right way. And then once I learned how to do that, now my laces on my shoes lie in a very perfect, clean way. And I'm not saying I'm, 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 I'm particular about how that looks, but I like my laces laying it the right way. If you want to learn how to, how to change light bulbs on cars, if you want to learn how to change the oil on things, if you want to learn how to, how to make lasagna, go and find that information. There are, again, training resources all over the place. I just read an article a couple of days ago on like a thousand different online courses you can take in, in hundreds and thousands of different areas. So <clears throat> find that, find those resources, find those online where you can learn how to, how to gain that education. Now, if you go back to those eight reasons of why businesses fail, six of those eight reasons can be mitigated just by knowing and understanding your bookkeeping and your accounting. Even if you hire an accountant, which is a great, a great idea. And I would recommend for many people to do that because it takes away the stress and the heartache of doing a lot of the cost, those kinds of things. You still need to know your numbers. You need to know what your profit and loss statement or your income statement says. You need to know what is my cash statement or my statement of cash flows look the way it does. What is my balance sheet telling me? So I want to just give a real quick introduction to these because you're going to need to know these more than any other report you're ever going to deal with, more than your tax returns, more than all of that stuff, these are the numbers you need to understand on a, on a, on a monthly and an annualized basis. Now, many of you have heard of what's called a profit and loss statement, a P&L. Sometimes we'll call it an income statement. So there's a lot of terms for the same thing. Basically what this is, it's just a financial statement. It helps us to determine what revenues came in on a particular month on a, in, during a particular year and what expenses went out during that same during that same time period, what the categories or what the various expense categories were of where those expenses went out. We take those expenses away then from our revenues or our income to come up to find out, did I make money or did I lose money? And you need to know that on a regular basis. I recommend that everybody does this on at least a monthly basis. If you want to do it quarterly, that's great. If you want to open up a, a, uh, a Christmas tree farm where you have all of your sales are in November and December, then, then maybe you don't need to do it during some of those months because you have really no income. Um, but you still need to be tracking those expenses to make sure that we're not overspending what we've brought in during those other two months as part of that. Now, this next one, the cash flow statement, if you were to put the cash flow statement and the, and the profit and loss statement side by side, they look almost exactly alike. There's not a lot of difference there. The income statement is looking at sales, taking out expenses. Cash flow, though, and if you don't learn anything else tonight, and it, I want you to learn this statement, and that is cash is king. Cash rules your small business. And that means that you have to have that cash flow coming into your small business. You need to have the cash flow coming in on a monthly basis, on a regular basis, in order to be, in order to sustain your business. The cash flow now statement will say, how much cash did I actually bring into my business? And how much cash went out or cash equivalents went out in my business? Or in other words, what did my bank account look like at the beginning of the month? What did my bank account look like at the end of the month? And this gives us now a detailed, an itemized list of exactly where that cash went rather than just sales. Because some of you may have sales on credit and I'm not talking about credit cards or debit cards. I'm talking about somebody that walks into your business and says, I need to get this and I'll pay you at the end of the month or next month or whatever it might be. You made the sale, which is recorded on the profit and loss, but it's not recorded on the cash. We only record how much cash came into my business so that's going to include not only sales that occurred, cash sales that month, but it's also going to be accounts payables, or I'm sorry, accounts receivables. How much money did I receive from those that I had to send bills out to? And as well as how much cash did I, did I pay out in my accounts payables? Utilities, rent, labor, um, supplies, taxes, uh, whatever it might be. 
so again, they look a lot alike, but they can have drastic results as we compare an income statement or a profit and loss statement from a cash flow statement. The last one we're going to look at here is what's called the balance sheet. A balance sheet is exactly what it says it is. We're comparing, if you look at the example here, we're comparing on one side of the balance sheet, what are all the assets that I have? What do I have as far as cash in the bank, inventory, um, uh, prepaid bills that I've already paid, um, my accounts receivables? What do I have in actual real life cash or assets? As well as what do I have in land, buildings, equipment, vehicles? We take out the, all of the accumulated depreciation there. What do I have in, in, in intangible assets, my goodwill, um, uh, whatever else there might be, to come up with a total of, this is my total amount of assets. We compare that on the opposite side to, what do I owe? How much do I still have to pay? Now, if I have a $100,000 truck that I have that I've gone out and paid for, and I have $90,000 that I owe, then I'll have $100,000 on one side of the balance sheet, on the other side, I'll have $90,000, but that doesn't balance. So then we have what's called stockholders equity or owner's equity. And that would be the $10,000 difference between what I owe and what the value is. That's what I could, if I was to sell that truck today for $100,000, I would pay the 90 and I would take 10. That would be my equity that I have in the business. We typically only do these once a year to help kind of give you a snapshot of what the business looks like at a specific point in time and helps us to understand, am I making progress? Am I paying down debt? Am I over-investing myself in my company? Where, how, am I, how am I looking as far, <coughs> excuse me, as far as my cash flow goes? Um, what's happening there regarding my notes payables and my, and my accounts receivables? <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, this is not COVID cough. Um, this is pneumonia recovery cough. So, uh, so uh, I, I apologize for, for, uh, for coughing in your, in your speakers this evening. But um, so anyway, this is what the balance sheet tells us. And this gives us some very important and really, really good information regarding our business that our other reports, our income statement and our cash flow statement are not going to tell us. So these are the three documents that you're going to need to understand. And if you don't understand them tonight, that's completely okay. But I would recommend that if, if you hire this out, that when you sit down and receive these, these reports on a monthly basis, you ask the questions. Ask the questions and don't pretend that you know, but I want you to know. And it's okay to ask the questions in the beginning because you're gonna be much wiser as a business owner and making better business decisions because you know what's going on financially inside your business. Now, as we get back to the business education side, read, 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 read go out and, and find, find literature from local state federal resources on business startups. We're gonna give you some resources later on this evening that you can take to help read and learn. I want you to understand social media, Facebook, Twitter, how do I read blogs? Go out and, and, and find companies that are doing what you're doing and then follow them. Find out what they're saying on Twitter. I could pull up Twitter right now and find out what's going on in the, garden, in the gardening industry. And I could search, probably search for gardening, and I can probably tell you within the last 15 minutes of what's going on in the garden, gardening industry because people are constantly sharing information on there. Use those resources available and they'll tell you exactly what's happening. Subscribe to business publications. Believe it or not, there's still newspapers that come out on a regular basis, magazines, online articles, online newsletters. My, my email is full every day of business information that comes in on a daily basis on all kinds of things. Find your industry, find those newsletters and start to get knowledgeable about what's going on there. Google Alerts is an amazing tool. You can go into Google, go into your account, just search for Google, Google Alerts. So you do a Google search for Google Alerts. It'll take you right in and you can put in keywords or keyword phrases or key phrases of exactly what do you want to search for on a regular basis. And every time a news article comes up, a website pops up, anything pops up with those keywords or phrases, you will get an email that will tell you exactly what's going on. Um, we do that for SBDC because we like to know what are, what are other SBDCs doing out there that we can bring into our community here to help us to help small businesses grow. Um, you might wanna do it on, on uh, CIC machines. You might wanna do it on uh, 3D printers. 
uh, find out what's going on in those industries and get those alerts. You can get them daily, you can get them weekly, you can get summaries, they give you a lot of options. But it, they send information to you, you don't have to go search that. And then always be open-minded. Uh, good business people are always looking for how to continue to be on that cutting edge for their small business. Don't think you know it all because there are those who think they've got it all figured out and the industry changes on them. And industry is changing nonstop these days. COVID threw us massive curves this, this year. And those that did well were those that were open-minded and introduced new ways of doing business in the middle of a pandemic. Those that really struggled were those who tried to stay with their old, mod old models and never pivoted to a new model. So be open-minded and find ways of being able to expand those. So our third way to combat causes of failure in a small business is developing your business plan. A business plan is an absolute must. I don't care if you're already in business. I don't care if, if you are just thinking about a business. Business plans are, are it. You have to start and, and work through the business plan. Business plans help us to identify the landmines. They help us to know what's out there that we don't know about to help us figure out again, where do, where do we need to plan better for? It's basically a roadmap. Now, many of you have gone on vacations and I like to use this example a, a few years ago, we went on a, on, a, on a 10 day drive back to Missouri to see my grandmother and we mapped everything out. We planned for months and months and months. We knew exactly where we were gonna stop for, to, to eat. We knew where we were gonna stop and get gas. We knew where we were gonna stop and sleep at night. We knew what hotels we were gonna stay at. I mean, we really literally planned for months and months before this for a trip that lasted 10 days. Many of you might have done the same thing. Maybe you've traveled to foreign countries. And, and, but how rare is it that we just wake up one morning and go, eh, I'm going to fly to Italy today and just go drive to Phoenix and get on an airplane and we fly to Italy. We don't do that. We plan. Now, if we're planning, if we're planning that long and spending that much time and effort thinking about just a little 10-day vacation or a three-day trip, why can't we spend that same amount of time for a business plan that we hope is going to last not only for us, but we can pass on for generations. It is your map for success. It helps us to get everybody on the same page. And it, maybe it's just you, maybe, it, maybe you have partners who want to do this, but it makes sure that we're all talking about the exact same things. Now, how formal does this have to be? Well, it depends. If you're just writing this for yourself as a business idea evaluation, it's okay. Your, your spouse knows you can't spell anyway, so don't worry about the spelling. But if we're gonna be sending this now to a lender, a bank, a potential investor, a potential partner, we better at least do a spell check and make sure that our punctuation's right and make sure that we're organized. It's gonna be much more formal in those situations, but in the beginning, just get the information out. Now the business plan has multiple sections within it. We, get, we give a little executive summary, which is kind of like the cliff notes of a book, but we write that very last. So we will skip this and, and I'm gonna give you a resource here in just a little bit. In fact, Tavia, if you want to go ahead and, and, and upload that for me, if you'll give that link to the business plan, Tavia's going to load this up for you here. This is going to give you a link to one of our resources from the Arizona Commerce Authority. Uh, it's a PDF file on about page three or four. It's going to actually start with the business plan itself. Um, and it's going to take you right through these. What does the marketing plan look like? Um, when we talk about marketing plan, we're talking about what's my product and services? Who's my target market? Uh, what's my pricing going to look like? What about my location? Um, how am I going to market this? Um, again, it's going to take you through all of those steps as part of the marketing plan. Then we're going to get into the management, uh, the management plan or what we call the operational plan. Who's running, owning and operating this business on a daily basis? How are we controlling inventory? How are we controlling sales? Are we an LLC? Are we a sole prop? Are we going to be a corporation? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. And then we get into the financial plan. How much money do I need? How am I going to use that money? And how am I going to pay that money back? And we do that again through developing pro forma statements. We, do, we go through that and develop projections using income statements, cash flow statements, and, and balance sheets. So we can, we can see what our, our get an estimate of what that business is going to do before you ever spend a penny to do that business. So we like to do financial projections as part of the financial plan to help you identify what are those expected, what are those expected returns. And I will tell you that it is that one point right there of why many people, as they think they have a great idea, will sit down and think and look at it and go, really, I'm going to make a hundred bucks this year. I don't know. This is really going to be worth it. 
I will never tell you that you have a bad business idea. I will never, ever, ever tell you that, that this is not going to fly. But as we go through the business planning process together, some of these things are going to kind of make themselves manifest as we go through the business plan. We're going to see the landmines and whether or not we can get past those landmines or not as part of that. And then finally, we have the strategic plan. This is more long-term planning. Sometimes we don't always do this as part, of a, as part of a startup process, but we do do this for existing businesses and helping them to strategically identify what are their strengths and weaknesses in their business and what can they do to become better? What opportunities exist out, them, out there that they could take advantage of? And are there any threats that still exist out there for them? I'll give you the example. <clears throat> uh, uh, medical marijuana here, here in Arizona, recreational marijuana just passed. Now, as a, as a, uh, I'm not making any, any political statements here. I'm not making any moral judgments on anybody. I'm just using this as just a, just a plain example. If I was looking at that uh, from, from the outside and thinking, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna open this up. This, maybe that's a great idea. Maybe that's a great business opportunity here. I heard it smoking. <laughs> Did you get that joke? All right. Anyway, it's a, maybe, maybe that's a really, really good opportunity for them to do right now. So they're gonna run right out and do that. There's, there's, there's lots of opportunity possibly for that depending on the communities. But what's the threat to that? The threat is right now it is still, it is still illegal or it is still federally illegal based on federal law. And at any, at any possible moment, could somebody come down and say, that's it, federal law supersedes state law and therefore we're gonna, we're gonna wipe that out. That threat still exists right now until the government makes some changes as, as part of that. We have to look at those kinds of things to identify what's coming down the road from your small business. And if you've stopped your education, you're not gonna know what those opportunities or threats are at. So your business education has to continue throughout the entire time. So how do we start the business plan? Well, number one, you just sit down and you just start brainstorming. Get your ideas out of your brain, which you think is a perfect circle and get them down on paper. Get a simple outline. Uh, Tavia has just uploaded that for you. Um, you're welcome to grab that. We will include these links in the email out to you on Monday as well. Start to use those outlines so you can figure out what's going to work best for me and my, uh, and, and, and my business idea. And it's gonna force you to have to work out the problems in advance. Now know that this is just an exploratory process in the very beginning. You're not gonna write your business plan on the, on the first draft. You're gonna identify all kinds of issues, problems, areas that you need to expand on, areas that need to be thought through more before you jump into a huge investment for your small business. Those plans are going to, to begin solid, to be more solidified as they start to emerge. So work over the business plan, continue to, continue to work it over more. Um, call us, we'll help you evaluate. We'll talk ideas out, we'll talk out issues. Are you identifying a problem here? Well, maybe we have a solution for it. Maybe I don't, but maybe I have a resource available to us that can help us figure that out. Don't forget your exit strategy. What do I mean by an exit strategy? Well, there's two, exits, two reasons for an exit strategy. Number one, you're Jeff Bezos and you're tired of doing Amazon. Your exit strategy is who am I gonna sell my business to? And, and how am I gonna get out of that? How, how am I, I mean, at some point you're gonna sell your business, right? So that's your first exit strategy is at what point am I gonna sell my business? But what happens on the opposite side is at what point do I need to get out of this so I don't continue to invest more and more and more? Because let's say we have $100,000 and we put, we say I can, I can afford to put $60,000 of my retirement into this, I have $100,000. And we, and we blow through that $60,000 and we're like, oh, I'm so close. We grab another 10 and that and that 10's gone. And we keep thinking, oh, I've worked this far. I've put this much into it. I can't, I can't walk away from it now. So we grab another 20. And before we know it, we've completely blown through an entire retirement program. And we've we've we haven't, it hasn't benefited the business. So we have to identify those exit points of when when do we need to step back? And that and then that hurts. That is a painful point of having to do that. But I'd rather you make that point early so we don't get into complete financial um, damage, but we get out while we still can. And, and, and we'll help you identify those points. And when does it make sense? Um, those are difficult conversations, but we need to have those conversations now before you get down the road. And then it becomes really, really, really personal at that point. It's very difficult to develop an exit, an exit strategy at that point until it's a forced exit strategy. Again, get help from the SBDC. We are happy to help you talk through ideas. We don't judge. We are, we are, we are confidential, number one. So whatever we talk about, whether it's in a Zoom meeting, whether it's here in our office, masked up, social distance, doing whatever we need to do, 
everything is confidential. We don't, we don't talk about your business concepts or ideas outside of, of, of what we do. So we're happy to do that. We can, we can do research on behalf of your business and find out what's going on in the industry. And at some point we have to finalize the plan in order to move forward. But remember, your business plan is always a live document. Technology changes, the industry changes, your market, target market changes. Things are gonna happen with it that are gonna have impacts on your small business. So remember that document is going to be live. It's going to be a guiding document, but we may need to make some adjustments to that along the way. Now, one of the big questions that we get from people are, do I need to be a corporation? What do I need to do? So I've put this together to help us to explain what's going on with business structures and which one works best for you. And I'm not going to tell you right here that you absolutely have to be an LLC or you have to be a corporation. That's going to come through conversation. That's going to come through identifying what's going on. It's going to come through lots of different um, evaluation of your business to help you identify what's going on. But the first on, on one side here, we have the sole proprietorship. In a sole proprietorship, you and the business are basically one and the same. Let's say I want to start mowing lawns. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to get a trailer. I'm going to get a, a really cool lawnmower. <coughs> and I'm going to go start mowing lawns. And people are just going to write me a check to Kevin Peck. And, and I'm going to go mow lawns. And we're basically me and my business are all one and the same. There's no difference between the business and me. Every, everything's all the same. It's, I'm using my Jeep to haul things around. We're, we're, I own all the equipment, but I'm doing it in the name of Kevin's, Kevin's, Kevin's lawn mowing service. The, one of the drawbacks to this is that there is, I have no liability protection. If I run over someone's prized statue that is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and, it, and my lawnmower destroys it, I'm liable for that personally as part of that. I have no liability protection. The nice thing about sole props is that they're super quick and easy to get set up. We, maybe we go get an EIN and we get our business license for the municipality we're going to be working in. Maybe we want to register our name. And we'll talk about some of that here in a couple of minutes. Actually, on the next slide, we'll talk about. And we're, and we're up and going. It, I mean, anybody can be a sole proprietor within a matter of days, maybe even the same day, depending upon your community. On the opposite end, we have corporations. Corporations take away a lot of the sole prop concerns. And now we are separating the business from the owner. The business is completely separate, which means now there is limited liability. If somebody wants to sue the company, they sue the company, but they don't, do not have access to your personal assets, your car, your home, your, business, your personal bank accounts, your whatever personal, whatever it might be. We separate those out now so that you have that liability protection. Now, corporations can be much more expensive and more time consuming to not only set up, but to also manage. There are annual reports that have to be submitted, annual meetings that have to be held. Um, there's, there's just more work that you have to do with the corporation. And as a corporation, you have to be taxed as a corporation. There's no, there's no flexibility in that. Once you're a corporation, you're taxed as a corporation. Now, in between those two, we have what's called a limited liability company. What it does is it takes the best of sole proprietorship and it takes the best of the corporation and we put it in this really cool package called a limited liability company. We still separate you from your business. The business is still its own completely separate entity. Again, we have limited liability. So if somebody wants to sue the, sue the, sue Kevin, I've, I've now, I now have Kevin's lawnmower service LLC. They can sue Kevin's lawnmower service and maybe they're going to take my lawnmower and maybe my trailer that are in the business name. But my personal assets are completely safe. As long as what we could do, as long as what we do, what we, if, as long as we don't, what we call pierce the veil. And that means I'm treating this, the, 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 the company as a sole proprietorship, meaning I'm, I'm using those funds for my own personal use. We talked about that earlier, right? Not using business funds for personal use. Business is business, personal is personal. And we have to use those, we have to keep those two things completely separate in every way, shape and form in order to not pierce the veil. We could lose our liability status if they prove in court that we have that we are not treating business like business. So make sure that we're keeping business, business and personal, personal. Lab, uh, LLCs are super quick and easy to do. Same day, really for the most part, for most people. Um, uh, we, we help you do the filings. Everything is electronic these days. Um, I, I will tell you right now, and, and, I, and I, this happens every time. And, 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 if, and if you've already done it, I apologize. But or groups like LegalZoom, um, uh, there are online companies who will tell you, pay us 600, 700, 800, 900, a thousand dollars, and we will organize your LLC. We will get your EIN. We'll do your name registration. We will do all of that for you. 
please avoid those companies. I'm not saying that they're bad in any way, shape or form, but an LLC can be done for as cheap as $85 for same day service. Um, your, your EIN is completely free. Uh, your business licenses might cost you 50 bucks. Um, your, your, your sales tax license, $14 to $18, depending upon where your business is located. Those things can be done very, very cheaply. So um, we want you to have control of your business. We want you to keep your money in your pockets. Again, they're not, they're not horrible companies by any means. They, they, are, they are providing a service, but we're here to tell you that it's possible to do things much easier and quicker and more inexpensive in the startup stages of your company without having to hire an outside firm to do that. So that's sole prop LLCs and corporations. Um, again, that's, I've, I've tried to simplify that down into a very, a very quick little conversation there for us. Let's, um, let's talk about business licensing. And again, if you have any questions while we're going through this, don't hesitate to put those in the chat. Don't hesitate to put those in the question and answer. We will try and answer those as we get through. Um, hopefully there's no questions coming in because I'm just giving you everything that you need to know and it's answering all of your questions. So um, I doubt that that's the case, but we are happy to answer any questions that you might have. So let's talk about your business licensing. Most people, again, are, don't really know what do I need to do or where do I, where do I go or what do I not do for my business from a licensing perspective. Um, first thing, city, city business licenses. It will al almost always be required that you have to have a business in whatever muni municipality that you are in. If you're in Payson, town of Payson is going to require you to have a business license. If you are in Pima, Pima the, the town of Pima is going to require you to have a business license to legally operate your business in that community. All right. There may be some businesses that they may not require because of what they what they do, but I haven't found a lot of those yet that they don't require. Um, I would rather you spend the, the $15, the $25, the, the, the $50 to get your business license and be legally authorized to operate your business in that community rather than flying underneath the, the cloak of darkness and trying to, trying to get away. Um, it's a small amount for peace of mind to know that you're doing things the right way. Again, check with City Hall. Typically, in most counties, there is not a county license. Um, again, I'm not super aware of what's going on in all of our other counties, what may be going on in Texas or what may be going on in California. But I know that here in, in my communities, Gila County, Graham County, uh, 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 Greenlee County, and Gila County, counties do not have county business licenses. They are only city business license and state, depending upon the type of business that you have. If you are selling products, I'm making candles and I'm selling candles that smell like, I don't know, road tar. <laughs> I make up some random stuff sometimes. Anyway, I have to make sure that I'm collecting sales tax on that for the state of Arizona and I send that to them. Sales tax does not cost you money. Basically, it's just the tax that has to be paid to transact that business. Um, and you're gonna want to know if you live in the city, it's going to be one rate. If you live in the county, it's going to be a different rate. So you need to know what your sales tax rates are for your TPT. And all you're doing is you're collecting that each month and sending that to the state collection agency. Again, California has their own board of equalization that they do. Uh, Texas is going to have their own. Arizona here in Arizona, we have the, the Department of Revenue that collects those for us. Um, again, if you just want to be a sole proprietor, Maybe you want to register your name with the state, with the Secretary of State's office. So you want to get what's called a DBA or doing business as. So let's say, again, I want to register Kevin's Lawn Mowing Service. I don't want to be an LLC. I would have a business now. And if I went to the bank to open up a business bank account, the bank's going to say, we need to see your DBA. And I would show that to him. And my bank account would then say, Kevin Peck, doing business as Kevin's Lawn Mower Service or Lawn Mowing Service. And then I can re receive checks as both Kevin Peck and I can receive checks as Kevin's on mowing service. And they know that I am, I am, I have a registered business name in the state of Arizona to receive those checks. Now, there may also be some industry specific licenses that you may have to get depending upon your state. Cosmetologists, um, <clears throat> um, massage therapists, contractors. If you want to build a building in our state, in, in Arizona, and I'm sure with any other state, there has to be a specific license that you have to have. Again, here in Arizona, that's going to be the registrar of contractors for, for those. But there are specific industries in the state of Arizona, depending upon uh, what your industry is and what you need to do. If you're going to be hauling, let's say that you're in the trucking business, there are certain industry licenses that you're going to have to have as part of that. We'll help you identify those and get that information. There are no federal licenses that you're going to need. 
outside of your EIN. Even as a sole proprietor, I would recommend that you get your EIN because you're identifying number, you're identifying a, a, a business number as a sole proprietor is your social security number. And, and, and in this day and age, we don't, I mean, it's probably already out there anyway, but we don't want that to be out there any more than it has to be. So let's get your EIN. It links your social security number and your and the EIN on the backside so nobody ever sees that. And now when you schedule, when you do your taxes at the end of the year for your business, we put the EIN, which then again goes right onto your personal taxes as part of that. So anyway, so those are our, that's our licensing that we need to do. Now, all of you are here tonight because you heard the SBA and the SBDC and the Department of Treasury is giving away all kinds of money. And so you're just here to find out what line do you need to get into to get that? Well, I'm gonna answer some of these, some of these key questions here real quick. And I know we're, running, we're, we're, we're wrapping up on time. So I'm gonna try and get through these as quickly as possible. As a general rule of thumb, there's no grant money available for for-profit startup businesses. We hear it all the time. Everybody comes in and says, I want to get a grant to open up my car wash company or my, or, or my car wash business. It just doesn't exist. The, the, the grant funds are just not out there. When we, when we talk about for-profit businesses, there are generally three types of funding. Personal capital. All right. Let's go with the Capital One credit card saying, what's in your wallet today? Right. How much money do you have saved in your bank account, savings account, checking account, retirement accounts? Well, how much money do you have to put into your, to your business? We also have what's called debt capital. Now we're either using credit cards, we're going to the bank to borrow money, we're going to a micro lender. We'll talk about those here in just a minute. Now, now we're paying somebody else to use their money for, for your business. Or we have equity capital, meaning you're going to go find somebody and says, I will give you 20% of my company for 50% ownership. This is the Shark Tank way of doing business. If you've ever watched Shark Tank, they're doing equity capital. They all want ownership in that company for a percentage ownership of that company. I would say we need to have a long, hard conversation about equity capital before you get into that, because now you are giving up ownership and you are giving up control of your business to somebody else who's not in the day-to-day -day operations of that business. Most lenders and investors are going to require a business plan. So you might as well just work on it as part of that and have that ready to go should we ever get to that point. The money's usually there. Sometimes it's very difficult to find. We, we, we look hard. We look all over the place to try and find that, but we can, not always, um, but we do try and find opportunities of how we're going to get you funded as part of that. And I will tell you that the first thing that they look at whenever we submit business loan applications is they're gonna look at you first for your personal credit history. Um, they wanna know, are you good with managing your money before they give you a big pot of their money to try and manage as well. Now, when we talk about, when people ask me, well, how much do I need to put down in my business? I've got some lending programs that'll take down to 20% of whatever the startup is. So if it's a, if it's a $100,000 startup, we might want to plan on about $20,000. Now that varies. We might be able to get it down to 10, but I, that's kind of a rare day. Plan on 20, 20 to 50% of the capital needed to start that business is going to have to come out of your own, your own pocket. That can be cash. It can be contributed equipment, materials, fixed assets, whatever it might be. We could use building or, or improved land, maybe even home equity we might want to pull as part of that. We have SBA loans available through the SBA. Now, the SBA doesn't make the loans, but they do as what they call SBA guaranteed loans, meaning we're still going to go to a traditional bank, Wells Fargo, Chase, uh, Washington Federal. Um, so a lot of our, so a lot of our micro lenders that, that, that lend, um, uh, uh, Dream Springs, uh, Prestamos, a lot of lenders, and again, we have a lot of lenders that you may not have ever heard of, they will also do SBA lending, meaning we may not fit in their traditional lending program, but with the SBA guarantee, we might be able to fit with that. So there's lots of SBA 504 and 7A programs, um, express loans that, that, that they have available to us um, to be able to do those. Conventional loans are just, again, just our regular banks. Regular lenders, our traditional lenders, our micro lenders that are, that are lending. We might have regional or local lending programs that are available to you. Um, I know that we have those both here in Graham County, Gila County, and they've just been rolled out in, in, in Gila County as well. So talk to your local SBDCs and find out what local lending programs might be existing there outside of our traditional lending. And then of course we have family and friends. Now I, I put an asterisk there because I, this is one of those that I always want to do very, very last. I don't care if, if it's your best friend. I don't care if it's Aunt Susan that has been your favorite aunt for 100 years. And she says, oh, I'll give you $50,000. You write a loan document between you and Aunt Susan. 
to make sure that she gets her money back and to make sure that you pay your money back to her. She might go, oh, it's don't worry about it. We'll just get to it whenever. Well, some point in time, Aunt Susan's going to come to your door and she's going to say, hey, you told me you were going to pay that back last year. If there's no documentation, I don't want you and Aunt Susan getting sideways. So we write out the terms. We're going to do this at five years at 5% or we're going to do this at 10 years at 5% or whatever that's going to be. Because I want to make sure that you and Aunt Susan are really, really still good at the end of the day, um, making sure that we're meeting the terms of that contract. Now, <clears throat> we're, pretty, we're pretty much wrapping up here now, but there's, I just want to leave you with a few thoughts here. We've talked about some sound business practices. And for those of you who are already in business, I, I hope you take, take, take to heart some of these. Those of you who are thinking about starting your business, these are going to be just as, just as applicable to you as well. We've talked about this already. Keep your personal and your business funds separate. I can't, I can't stress that enough. I see too many businesses who are in stress times right now because they're combining those way too much. Make sure you have insurance on your business. We've talked about liability with LLCs, but you still wanna make sure that you are insured in case somebody does sue you and you don't lose the business, all right? General liability insurance is not expensive, um, but it's, it can be a great, great opportunity to be able to protect your business. Pay your taxes. The second thing that banks are gonna to want to know about your business, if whether you're selling it or whether you're trying to find funding, give us your tax returns. If you're trying to sell your business and somebody wants to buy it, they're gonna ask for the business tax returns. You can't avoid it. You're gonna to have to do it. You gotta got be legitimate in making sure those are taken care of. We've talked about knowing your numbers, profit and loss statements, cash flow statements, balance sheets. If you don't know your numbers, come and see us. We'll help you to know those numbers. If we, if we have a, it doesn't matter whether you have a bookkeeper, you're doing it yourself. We want you to understand those as much as you can. Don't be proud, get help. Um, don't, don't pretend like you know more than, than what you don't. The next one here is the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't really know. Um, I mean, I've been, I've been number one, a small business owner myself for about 17, 18 years. Um, I'm in this now doing this on a daily basis, on a daily basis, helping others. And I'm still learning about what's going on in small businesses because things change. So again, don't be afraid to ask. We are, we are a non-judgmental zone here. We want you to understand. We want you to know. We want you to be confident in your business because you need to make wise and good decisions for your small business. The other thing too here is, is don't, just because we might fail at some aspect of this, turn your failures <coughs> into success by, <coughs> by learning what you did wrong. Let's try it again. I have a good friend of mine who, when I, when I first moved back here to the Gila Valley a long time ago, he is the serial entrepreneur and he threw mud and he, he opened up, I'll bet he had five or six different businesses that he opened up during that period of time because he wanted to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to have his own business. He wanted to be successful. And, and one would open up and it didn't work. And one would open up and it wouldn't work. And he kept slinging and he kept slinging and he kept throwing mud up against the wall. And, and, and about seven years ago, eight years ago, he hit it and he found the fit. And, and, and he, he grew one of the biggest businesses that, that, that in statewide business and, and was extremely successful just because he never stopped taking the lessons that he learned and applying them to the new business idea to try and be successful. So don't give up, don't stop. And then finally, my, my, last, my last thing that I share with you on this is, are you happy doing what you're doing? Are you happy and are you content doing what you're doing or do you wanna have more? Now, I'm not saying that your business is going to be a guarantee. And I'm not saying that if you come and work with us, it's, we're going to guarantee you success with that. But we're going to at least, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to at least give it the effort that we need to, to identify whether you've got a shot at this thing or not. And, and then we're going to go to work and we're going to bust our tails to try and get it. We want you doing what you love to do. Life's way too short to do something that you just aren't happy doing for your whole life. So let's make an effort to try and do more as part of that. Now we've mentioned a number of resources tonight. I'm gonna to give you three resources here real quick. Um, Tavia, would you go ahead and load up the Entrepreneur's Edge from the Arizona Commerce Authority? And if you will also load up the, um, the small business checklist. Remember I told you we don't have a checklist, but on the ACA website, again, one of our partners here, they also have a, wherever you're located at in the state of Arizona, you can go in and go through a checklist of saying, this is the kind of business I want. This is where I'm located at. And it will give you a list of licensing and things that you might have to do. Now, I'm not going to give that to you and just say, okay, you go, you go run. You're going to get this. I would still recommend no matter where you're at, get in contact with your SBDC, have them help guide you. You may add some things in there that may not be required for your business. So we want to help guide you, but this is going to be kind of a good starting point as part of that. 
The Entrepreneur's Edge, also from the Arizona Commerce Authority, is going to give you some, um, it's, the, it's the business plan portion of that Entrepreneur's Edge, but there's about 50, 60 other pages of great information, lending opportunities, all those kinds of things. I give those to you because I want you to be knowledgeable. I want you to understand and see what's available to you out there. Again, I want to recommend to you that go to the azsbdc.net. They are our statewide organization for Texas and California. Just search for California Small Business Development Center, Texas Small Business Development Centers, and you're going to find your networks in those states to be able to do that. So find your SBDC in your area, and they're going to walk you through exactly what you need to do and provide that assistance that you need as part of that. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the SBA, sba.gov. Um, for all of the things that are going on small business, have some amazing resources available to you there. So we invite you to go to any one of those resources and find out what there, what are available there to you and your small business as part of that. So with all that being said, I have gone through everything. I gave you a bonus six minutes, which number one, I may apologize for, but I'm not gonna charge you anymore for tonight because we gave you an extra six minutes. So anyway, I hope tonight has been, has been um, informative for you. I hope we've been able to give you the information that you need to make some of those decisions. Again, if you're just kind of kicking the tires around right now and not really sure what to do, it's completely okay. Tonight was really designed just to kind of peek, let, you, let us peek underneath the hood a little bit so you can kind of see what are some of the things that I need to be considering right now. What are those landmines that are out there right now that I need to overcome before I start, start taking those next, those next steps? So. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to post those up. We'll answer those in the next few minutes if we need to. Um, again, you're welcome to reach out to us um, here at the SBDC. Uh, you'll have all of our contact information. We'll come out to you again on Monday. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. If you're from an area outside of our area and you don't know who to call or talk to, reach out to us. I will find your SBDC in your area and make sure I, I, I make a direct contact uh, with, with whoever that might be so that uh, we have a good smooth transition. Again, we've got 60 people throughout the state of Arizona here doing this exact same thing. We're all about building your business and making sure we get you taken care of as part of that. So again, everybody, thank you for taking this last hour with us. We appreciate you spending time with us. Um, we Hopefully we get to work with you more in the future. Um, again, thanks to all of you. Thanks again, thanks for being here tonight. And uh, hopefully we get a chance to be able to work on your business idea in your small business future in the next little while. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.